Today's podcast is going to be a short podcast. I want to talk about divulging confidential details in interviews, resumes, cover letters, LinkedIn profiles, and what is too much and what is too little. Well, let's assume you have a resume, right? And you worked for a bank or whatever company it is. And you divulged confidential information in that resume. Let's say you named a client and you did not have permission to name a client. Or you worked on something very sensitive. And even though you weren't sure if you could name a client, you know that by naming the client, it actually doesn't help the client's image. Now, if I was a consultant or a consulting partner, again, and I was looking at your resume, I wouldn't be impressed that you named the client. I would not at all be impressed that you know you worked for this client. I would think to myself, okay, why did you name this client? You know, what is the value of naming this client? And I'd also think to myself, more importantly, you know, if you worked for us, would you name clients? So you lose a little bit of integrity and a little bit of respect when you name clients. You should never name clients, right? I always tell candidates, don't name a client. Don't say, I did work for General Electric to help them develop a new risk mitigation strategy which saves the company $23 million in fines by identifying employees that were breaking rules or whatever. I would say something like, worked for a $100 billion diversified industrial company. In this case, you know, it's quite easy to guess it's either Siemens or GE. You could also say that worked for a Fortune 10 diversified industrial company to determine X, Y, Z. So there you are hiding the information, but you're also, the trick is to hide valuable information, but also provide information that's useful. I find a lot of candidates don't even want to say it's a Fortune 10 company. They'll say something like, well, you know what, Michael, there's only three Fortune 10 diversified industrial companies. The client may figure out that I worked for this company. If you tell me something like that, it's obvious you don't know how to you know, rationalize things logically. There is no way the client can know who you worked for. Even if there's only one diversified industrial company, the client still can't even know because you didn't name them. So what I would say is that when you hide confidential information, which you should hide, you should also provide descriptive information. So remove the fact that you worked for GE, but add in the information that you worked for a $100 billion diversified industrial, or you worked for a Fortune F10 diversified industrial based in the United States. So what I find with many candidates is they go on certain extremes. They either provide too much information, or other candidates, they provide no information because they think everything is confidential. Not everything is confidential. You can name the type of company you're in, the revenue streams, what industry they're in, and so on. So be very wary of that, right? I once had a candidate who told me that she cannot name the telecom company she works for in Russia as a client because someone reading her resume may figure that out. And I told her, look, there's no way to figure it out. There are a couple of telecoms companies in Russia, mobile telecoms companies. How will someone figure out it's this company? She said, well, no, they may figure it out. And the reason I was unhappy with that is that it's an irrational fear. The person cannot explain how someone will figure it out, but they just are worried. Consulting is all about rational logic. If you're going to be afraid of everything without a reason, you obviously can't be in consulting because you're letting your emotions dictate decisions. You should be able to explain why you think the information you're providing or the information I want you to provide is going to help identify the client. But if you cannot explain that, if you're just going with emotion, then you should really question whether you should be in management consulting to start off with, right? So on resumes, cover letters, I want a lot of detail. Consulting firms want a lot of detail, but you don't have to put identifying detail. You know, if you worked for company, revenue, size, all important, location is good, what kind of work you did is very important. Now, the other things you may want to consider is that your LinkedIn profile and your resume should be the same. Candidates always tell me that, you know, I put some information in my resume, and I always tell them, well, whatever you put in your resume, you need to put in your LinkedIn profile. So and I don't want to put it in my LinkedIn profile. Then I ask them this very simple question. If it shouldn't be for public consumption, why is it in your resume? And that's my point. If you cannot put something in your LinkedIn profile, that means it's not for public consumption and it shouldn't be in your resume. That's what I advise candidates to do. Rewrite it so that it gives enough information. But if you need to put it into the public domain, you can put it should never, ever be afraid to put your resume onto LinkedIn. If you are afraid to put your resume into LinkedIn word for word, bullet for bullet, then there's probably something not right in your resume. And as I pointed out many times, there are ways to rewrite your resume, but by putting in significant amount of detail with numbers without identifying the clients. And remember something, you can justify it any way you want, but if you edit down that point so that I can't identify the client, I can't identify the industry, I don't know the client size, I will be very wary of attaching too much credence to a significant achievement. For example, if you tell me that you helped a company redesign their market entry strategy that led to a 20% increase in sales, I'm obviously more impressed if this was a $2 billion company 
versus a $200,000 mom and pop store in rural Wisconsin. So obviously the identifying features and the size of the company play a big role in how I will interpret the bullet point, right? And beyond that, a common tactic I teach candidates when they're giving details and fit questions is put a name to the person they are talking about. It doesn't have to be the person's real name, but more or less, if you put the person's first name, no one's ever going to identify them, really. I mean, even in my experience, I can name, you know, I reported to a partner called David, a great guy. No one's ever going to figure out who David is. No matter what I talk about him, no one will ever figure out who David is. So if you are talking about a project you manage and how two associates were not doing very well, you can give them their first names, real first names, Kate and Joshua. Obviously, don't give their last names. If you're uncomfortable about that, still give them a made-up name. Tell the interviewer, for the sake of confidentiality, I'm going to use the name Kate. Because if you just, if imagine you, you are giving a foot story and you've never given a name throughout and you start saying things like she and eventually after I spoke to her, we went to this and she didn't like it and this other lady wanted to change something but she also didn't like it. Can you see how confusing that becomes? I struggle to then understand who the actors are in the foot story. If you give them names, I can follow the names. And that's a big mistake people make in fit. They won't give names. They'll use things like she, he, this person, and it just becomes really confusing eventually. So I expect candidates to give a lot of information. You can provide a lot of information without identifying a client. If you choose not to provide information for me to understand the context of the client, I think you do that at your peril. There's a lot of information you can provide without identifying the client. Again, if you cannot put in LinkedIn, it shouldn't be on your resume. You don't want to you know, play in that gray area in terms of what's ethical and what's legal. And finally, if you do not put identifying features in terms of names into fit interviews, it becomes ridiculously difficult to follow the fit interview.